Regulation of Gene Expression Part 2, Eukaryotic Gene Regulation. Here are some of the questions we'll be addressing. What are acetylation and methylation, and why is eukaryotic gene regulation so complex? What is pre-mRNA? Describe some of the post-transcriptional modification that has to happen to pre-mRNA in eukaryotes before it can be translated into protein. Explain how the organization of eukaryotic genetic material into introns and exons can increase phenotypic variation. I'm Mr. W from learn-biology.com, where we believe that interaction and feedback is what leads to deep, substantial learning. We're so sure of that, that we provide a money-back guarantee that comes with your subscription. Gene regulation in multicellular eukaryotes, key issues. Organisms like you and me and lizards and redwood trees and jellyfish, any multicellular eukaryote is composed of trillions of cells organized into specialized tissues. We have 46 chromosomes, 3 billion base pairs in each haploid genome, and 20,000 genes. Gene regulation is a big and complex issue. Here are some more parts of that issue. Every single cell has the same DNA, but cells need to know which genes to express as they develop. And gene regulation, as we just saw with prokaryotes and operons, is also influenced by factors in the environment. How do genes get turned on and off? Note that most eukaryotic DNA is non-coding. So what's the difference between the coding DNA and the non-coding DNA? And genes contain introns. We've mentioned these before. Now we'll really look at them in depth. In eukaryotic cells, what determines which genes are expressed? Let's start with this fact. In any cell in a multicellular organism, most of the DNA is not expressed. You have cells that make up the lens of your eye. Those cells express a single protein. That means that 19,900 something other proteins are not being expressed. All those genes are turned off. Those genes that are turned off are tightly packaged around proteins that are called histones. That's what these disks over here represent. There's an additional chemical modification, which is called methylation. It's the addition of a methyl group, that carbon attached to three hydrogens, and that prevents transcription. In the few genes within any cell that are turned on, there's a process called acetylation that loosens up the DNA, and that makes it possible for RNA polymerase to come in, find the promoter, and transcribe the genes. What is epigenetics? We just talked about how in most cells, most of the DNA is not transcribed. It's silenced. It's turned off. Only a small number of genes are turned on. What's the difference? That is all defined by this newly emerging topic that's called epigenetics. Epigenetics are changes in DNA expression that involve reversible chemical modifications of DNA or modifications in DNA packaging. Chemical modifications of DNA, methylation. Modification in DNA packaging, wrapping around these proteins that are called histones. But the genes themselves, the sequence of nucleotides is not changed. It's a level above the genetic level. That's why it's called epi genetics. It's responsible for the differentiation of tissues during development. Why are skin cells expressing skin proteins where fingernail cells are expressing fingernail proteins and muscle cells expressing muscle proteins? Those are all about epigenetics because all of those cells contain the same genes. Somewhat astonishingly, sometimes these changes can be transmitted from one generation to the next. That's a newly emerging field of study, and that's intergenerational transmission of epigenetic modifications of the genome. What's the connection between epigenetics, cell differentiation, and gene expression? The key idea, one that needs to be memorized, is that all cells in the same organism are genomically equivalent. Every cell in your body, except for your gametes, has the same 
DNA. All cells are descended from the zygote. That's shown at number one in this diagram. All cells have the same DNA. That's shown at three and four. Cells differentiate because they express different genes, and that relates to the epigenetic modifications that we just talked about in the previous slide. Describe on a big picture level how transcription is regulated in eukaryotes and eukaryotic cells. Previously, we talked about operons, which is how genes can be turned on and off in response to environmental changes. Eukaryotes have to be able to do that too. Some of that relates to acetylation, methylation, histones, the things we've talked about, but some of this is on a more immediate regulatory level. So let's look at the regulatory processes that occur in eukaryotes. Eukaryotes possess regulatory DNA sequences that interact with regulatory proteins to control transcription. I know that this diagram looks horrifyingly complex, but you really only need to know it on a basic level so you can understand questions that might come your way on unit tests or on the AP bio exam. Some of these regulatory sequences include promoters. We've talked about those in the context of transcription. So there are promoters shown at letter E. There are also enhancers that are shown at letter A. And what they do is they increase the probability that a gene will be transcribed. They enhance that possibility. Interactions between activator proteins, they're shown at B. DNA bending proteins, that's at F mediator proteins at G, and general transcription factors, H, enable RNA polymerase, shown at letter I, to bind, making transcription possible. All you really need to know is that this kind of system is one that's used for eukaryotic gene regulation. You'd never be asked to differentiate between these mediator proteins at G and these general transcription factors. You just need to know the big picture. This is what eukaryotic gene regulation can look like. How can gene expression be coordinated in different body tissues? During development, as we've discussed, different tissues express different genes. But those different tissues can also share common regulatory sequences that enable the transcription of genes within those various tissues to be coordinated. An example of that is that the tissue in a male lion's neck skin, I'm talking about this over here, and their muscle tissue express different genes. One's expressing the hair that makes up the mane, and the other is expressing the tissue in the muscle. But both of those tissues share a common testosterone receptor gene. That testosterone receptor gene gets expressed as a cytoplasmic receptor, and therefore when testosterone gets released into the body, it binds with the testosterone receptor. This becomes a transcription factor that goes into the nucleus and activates genes. The genes that are activated are going to be different depending on whether those cells are in the lion's neck or in the lion's muscle tissue. But that leads a single hormone, in this case, to be able to induce changes in different tissues. It's coordination of gene expression in different body tissues. Is AP Bio making you feel overwhelmed and inadequate? That's completely reasonable. At learn-biology.com, we understand why students struggle with AP Bio. The material is complex, the pace is brutal, and the vocabulary is ridiculous. But at learn-biology.com, we've created a way that makes it easier for you to study. Go to learn-biology.com, sign up for a free trial, and complete our interactive tutorials and interactive AP Bio exam reviews. We guarantee you a four or a five on the AP Bio exam. See you on learn-biology.com. What are introns, exons, what's required to make translatable mRNA in eukaryotes? Introns are intervening sequences of DNA within genes. They're transcribed into pre-mRNA. Here's an intron in DNA. Here's an intron in pre-mRNA. Exons are DNA that becomes RNA that ultimately becomes mRNA that gets expressed 
into protein. It gets translated into protein. And that is just a bit of the processing of pre-mRNA that has to happen in eukaryotes. Here's the process of transcription, relatively straightforward. But then what we need to have happen is all of these introns need to be cut out and then the mRNA needs some modification so that it can survive in the cytoplasm and be translated by a ribosome into protein. We'll see that in a couple of slides. Describe some of the post-transcriptional modification that has to happen to pre-mRNA in eukaryotes before it can be translated into protein. In eukaryotic cells, pre-mRNA is what's transcribed from a protein coding gene. So this is DNA over here. You can tell because it's a double helix. And this is pre-mRNA, right over here at number two. Before it can be translated into protein, that pre-mRNA has to be processed in several ways. It has to get an addition at its five prime end of a GTP cap and a three prime poly A tail. Poly A tail, it just means it's adenine, 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 adenine all over again. As we've discussed previously, introns, those intervening sequences that don't code for protein, need to be excised. They need to be cut out. And then the fragments that consist of the exons need to be spliced together. Then you wind up with mRNA that can be translated into protein. What is the function of the five prime GTP cap and the three prime poly A tail that's added to mRNA during eukaryotic RNA processing? That five prime GTP cap, which is shown over here at G, protects the mRNA from breakdown by enzymes in the cytoplasm. And it also assists the mRNA in leaving the nucleus and binding with a ribosome. The three prime poly A tail shown over here that makes the mRNA more stable and it delays its enzymatic breakdown by enzymes that are in the cytoplasm. Explain how the organization of eukaryotic genetic material into introns and exons can increase phenotypic variation. As we've discussed before, exons are expressed sequences. They're translated into amino acid sequences. Introns are intervening sequences that are spliced out of mRNA before translation. Here we have DNA and here we have pre-mRNA. And what we've got to do is we've got to cut out these introns. But in eukaryotes, there's a process called alternative splicing. Through alternative splicing, exons can be spliced together in alternative ways, allowing for the production of multiple protein versions from the same pre-mRNA transcript. So for example, in this mRNA and in this protein, what we've done is we've dropped out a couple of the exons. There's exon one, three, four, and six. Here's another version of the same protein, exon one, two, five, and six. And here's yet another one, exon one, two, four, five, and six. The basic idea is that each of these exons codes for what's called a functional domain, a piece of the protein that can actually do something. You put those functional domains together and you get proteins with slightly different functions. They're all within the same close family. They're all from the same gene, but they're different manifestations of those genes, and they provide for additional phenotypic variation that's found in eukaryotes, but it doesn't happen in prokaryotes who don't have the intron-exon organization of their coding genes. Explain the role of small RNAs in eukaryotic gene regulation. Small RNAs are exactly what they sound like. They're segments of RNA that don't consist of a huge number of nucleotides, yet they play important regulatory roles in the cell. One of these is microRNAs. MicroRNAs are particularly small, and they play a role in what's called post transcriptional control of gene expression. That's exactly what it sounds like. It's after transcription. A key process that microRNAs are involved in is called RNA silencing. Here's how it works. Here's DNA. That DNA will contain a gene that codes for a microRNA. 
Not all genes code for proteins. Some of them just code for RNAs. In the same way as pre-mRNA needs to be processed before it matures, there is processing of the pre-microRNA to make it into mature microRNA. In the same way as ribosomal RNA will connect with protein, this microRNA will connect with a protein that's called an RNA silencing complex protein. Together, that RNA plus the RNA silencing complex protein will do one of two things. If the microRNA completely matches 100% part of a sequence within an mRNA, then that complex will cause the mRNA to be degraded and destroyed. If, on the other hand, there's a partial match, then this complex will cause a pause in translation. In either case, what have we done? We've changed expression of a gene through microRNA. Want to learn more? Sign up for a free trial of the website that guarantees your AP Biology success, learn-biology.com, and watch this next video.